you know what that means. It's time for a little chat. Today, I want to talk about how we might criticize and analyze ideas or worldviews, that is to say, systems of ideas, or specifically, or, you know, ideology, systems of ideas that reflect, define the term with Marx, false consciousness. That's what ideology is, Marx's view. Um, there is a tendency among liberalism to consider ideas equally valid. Everybody has a First Amendment right to say what they believe. And then, of course, we might judge whether it is truthful, what purpose it serves, what narrative it tries to get across. But there is not a sense that we can say that there are some ideas um, that simply would not be afforded the same kind of equivalent status as valid ideas, um, but that all are equally as valid. Now, I think I want to go through the process here of first explaining and going back to Hegel's critical framework of how we can deal with things in the real world that we consider actual or not actual, like a, a critical criterion of reason that allows us to dismiss some things as non-substantial. Um, then the way in which Ludwig Feuerbach builds on Hegel's philosophy to make sense of Christianity. I don't know if any of you have read Feuerbach's The Essence of Christianity. Could I have a show of hands, please? No. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about that because that provides a template of how you might use Hegel's way of thinking as a tool for a critique of a system of ideas. And then we have, and we'll see if we get as far today, Marx's um, thesis on Feuerbach, reading Feuerbach and critiquing the limitations of Feuerbach, which then also, I think, and I don't think I've included this in the reading list, but I think the next text after that, which goes a step further, <clears throat> is to read Marx's on the Jewish question, because it uses some of the same kind of figures of thought that he had tried out in the Feuerbach thesis, as well as that the Jewish question is often brought up by critics of Marxism um, and cited falsely as an example of Marxist anti-Semitism. By the way, this is a reminder that masking is a requirement, and if you don't have a mask, please go get one and come back once you've found it. Um, that is especially true since at this point, it is um, daily that I get emails from students saying, I have COVID, my roommates have COVID, so forth. So it is required. I want to start by giving an example of the kind of thing that might be criticized as false, as ideological in public discourse in ways that aren't helpful. Who has heard about what is currently happening or rumored to be happening in Springfield, Ohio? So what's going on there? Haitian hey, uh, immigrants were chopping the heads off of ducks and eating them, taking them home. From the so is the narrative. Um, the Haitians are coming after ducks, cats, and other livestock. Um, this has been germinating among ultra far-right internet um, forums for some time. It is now being taken mainstream by officials um, associated with the Republican Party, like Senator Ted Cruz, um, a Twitter account called Publius, 
Fox News, um, OAN, what have you. So the story here is you have Haitian immigrants who are being housed in this town of Springfield, Ohio, and they will come and eat your pets. Um, that is an invention. There is nothing to it. The local police have said there have been no reports of missing pets. But it is, of course, being reported in these circles as, and then repeated as fact. And it serves as the basis for the mobilization of a violent mob. If you have been paying attention to how things have gone in Germany and in Britain recently, anti-immigrant riots. And in Germany, this goes back all the way to the 1990s in some spots where there is a, by now, well honed rumor mill and propaganda mill that will identify a certain group of people as a threat by saying, um, usually, in fact, it is rape accusations. Then it is theft, you know, they're disrespecting us, they're taking our money uh, by living on welfare. So it's a long list of things where anti-immigrant propaganda has built on established tropes of racism. You all know Angela Davis's um, essay on the myth of the black rapist and the justification of the lynch mob in the South um, that describes exactly how one group of people was built up to look as a permanent threat that had to be maintained under control. And if individuals stepped out of their assigned boundaries, be put back in their place, usually with the threat or actual acts of violence. So this um, is a long established fable. In recent years, it has received more urgency through the use of social media, um, but not just by random actors using social media to spread this, but in the case of the recent British uh, riots against immigrants, Elon Musk, personally was sharing and forwarding or whatever, like reposting uh, some of the propaganda items and thereby contributing to the violence. Um, he has done this with complete impunity so far. Um, and there has been no recognition in any mainstream media or politics of this. So given this background, that this is essentially, you know, the chronicle of an announced murder, um, we know where this is going. We've seen it twice before um, in Germany, in England. There's no reason to assume it will not have deadly consequences here. It is a build up to justify a violent mob that will aim to kill people or at least drive them out of town under threat of violence. There was this um, meme here created with AI of two gray haired older women sitting behind a window with the number of cats, I count two, four, six, seven cats and eight or nine tails, it's AI generated. <laughs> um, child is cat ladies for Trump. Outside of the window, there's a blow, a torch wielding mob of black people, presumably Haitian uh, immigrants. I don't know if you can see it here, um, but it's been going around. So cat ladies for Trump after Americans learn Haitians are eating cats in Ohio. Vote Trump, save the pets. There's another one showing Donald Trump hugging a duck and a kitten um, to protect them. So <laughs> why am I going there? Because 99% um, of the liberal public responds to this by saying, um, well, gee, look at this. To quote one person here, if you don't see what's batshit insane about this, I can't help you. So it's evil. It's stupid, it's insane. Um, that is usually 99% of the response. Then if you suggest that a political response may be required, you will get replies along the lines of, well, it's not a federal issue. What are we supposed to do about it? You can't mm -hmm. legislate away races. In other words, there's a certain acceptance here that says, yes, this is a fact of life. People will, this is an example of racism. Of course, people will think like that. Really, what are we supposed to do about it? We can read the 1619 project. We can do 
um, ethnic studies. We can have museums and public markers that show the history of racism, racial violence, and racial oppression. In other words, we can try to tell the story of how race shaped this country and how um, it is part of the national story and how bad and how wrong that is. That is perhaps the only action-oriented reply I've seen out of liberal circles and kind of educational blitz of telling people that racism is a thing and that it is bad. But that's about it. So political responses, on the other hand, might entail denouncing the campaign to set up this group of people as designated victims of a mob looking for a victim. A political, politically informed campaign might criticize the way of thinking that identifies immigrants or refugees collectively as a problem and in fact as the blanket explanation for a range of problems that have very little to nothing to do with immigrants or immigration or population of any sort, but have sociological, economic, political, legal, etc. Uh, grounds. It might be a simple declaration of solidarity with the people to, to say, you know, we are, we see them as neighbors and friends. We want them to be here. Um, they are welcome and they should not be afraid. There are so many different things that you think politically that you could do in a situation like that. Um, but what is, of course, at play here is precisely this notion that ideas do not need to be taken seriously, especially ideas that you can easily dismiss as quote unquote evil and stupid. Um, and what I'm proposing to do here is to do the opposite, to do, to do ideas um, the honor of treating them as linked to the real world in that they mean something to the people who hold them. They are, after all, not random. There is something ancient and established about this notion that the group amongst us is a threat of who are willing to and habitually commit horrific acts of violence that transgress um, deeply held boundaries. For instance, um, in the Middle Ages, the accusation that preceded pogroms against Jews and Jewish parts of town, uh, the burning and ransacking of these parts of town, were usually based on the assumption, on the basic rejection of Jews as uh, murderers of our savior, then also on specific allegations that there had been an outbreak of the plague that must have been because the Jews poisoned the wells. And there is a missing person that must be, especially young women, um, that must be because Jewish ritual requires the drinking of the blood of Christian virgins, for instance. So there's the blood libel, there's the well poisoning idea um, that are deeply rooted and that make reappearances time and again. Um, and in the same fashion, if you look at all the examples of what specific accusations against minority groups, against local populations of refugees or immigrants came up. Um, it's usually something in this vein. So for, if somebody in the Middle Ages had stood there and shaken their hand, you know, yeah, you can't do anything about Christian fundamentalist delusions. Um, of course, we know that it's, it has nothing to do with this generation of Jews, whether or not the ancestors killed our savior, also, they probably didn't poison the wells, and there's no evidence that they have ever killed or you know, let the blood of um, a Christian girl. But what can you do about it? You know, that would be a, a, pretty much an abandonment of your responsibility there. Um, yet, that seems to be the main response that you get. So, there, but it's not just the question of whether the theory that patients eat pets 
is valid or not. Um, or to say it is meant to incite violence against them. It is clearly not just an innocent belief people hold. It is also something that ruthless agitators are putting out there because they want power. Now, here's another theory of ideology um, that may be slightly more sophisticated than the one that says it's evil and stupid. But it is still um, one that doesn't really have to grapple with the context of this idea by saying there's a rational component here. And the rational component is the interest of this agitator to gain power by harnessing um, the violence of a mob that will follow him, whether this is somebody local or whether this is more broadly speaking, Trump who wants to build up a background noise of menacing violence against minorities, opponents, um, it is still the idea that the false consciousness, the ideology, has a rational basis in the power interest of the agitator. So um, the priests know the truth, but they're telling the lies to the faithful um, out of selfish reasons. That, too, does not suffice, because, after all, these ideas are not random. It doesn't have to be. There's nothing that is... Um, inevitable about Haitian immigrants being the target, about it being in Springfield, Ohio, or about the allegation being that they eat pets. But there is something inevitable about the combination thereof, or some combination thereof, that there are elements that can, that can be mixed and matched, but you cannot just at random pull this um, kind of scapegoat fantasy out of a hat. It has to conform to established ways of thinking. And they, these are not random. So people would say, well, Trump can just lead his supporters anywhere. Whatever he says, you know, is going to be something they follow because they're so bonded to him as this authority figure. Of course, that is nonsense. If Trump had done a 180 and said, from now on, I want you to get into French 18th century poetry and consider that to be the most fulfilling thing you can do. Forget all that stuff about threats to a country. All we really need is for all, us, for all of us to be reading these uplifting works and work toward spreading the joy of having that in public reenactments. My rallies will be fully devoted to recitations from now <laughs> onward. That wouldn't have helped. That would not have shown. It is not randomly replaceable. There is a specific content and the point is to figure out what it is. Um, you could also say the ideology serves a purpose, and it does. It wants to um, create an occasion for people who you might call low information voters or whatever else, um, but it wants to create an occasion for people to join in a cause that is good and holy. Um, you want to defend especially the weak, who have been threatened by the violence. So there is nothing much more honorable than to come to the defense of weak and helpless um, persons or creatures and defend them against random acts of brutal um, malicious violence. And if you can tell yourself that you're doing it by beating up patients or setting on fire um, the, the housing where they live, like they did in, in Rostock, like they did in uh, that, that South English town, and so forth. If you can convince yourself that this is a good deed and that you can join an organization or a movement that is committed to doing such good deeds repeatedly and often until the threat has been fully eliminated, um, that is a purpose, you know, to build a power base, to build a movement. Um, and from that, logic, you can get to the famous Himmler speech to his troops after the massacre that you've heard about, where he says, you know, it's basically the smell of blood is still in the air, the smell of earth from having people dig their own mass grave before you um, butcher them, and everybody is still somewhat shaken and drinking their beer and liquor with a certain trepidation after these acts. 
thinking perhaps that there may be something um, upsetting about it. And so Himmler uses that to say, um, you did good. You um, did what was necessary and you managed to maintain decent human decency in the end. Because what you did here served to protect for the long term um, your children and your women and all Germans. Um, you help eradicate the menace that is inherently evil and that will come after us if we don't get it first. And this may not have been a pretty picture. And it may on occasion have given you trouble with your conscience. But never once forget that you did the right thing in the big picture. So if you can um, dehumanize people to the point where murdering them, driving them out of town, spitting at them, etc., makes you look to yourself and to your to the people who act with you as a hero who is in the business of protecting the weak. Um, there is something there if you think that you want to build um, a fascist movement that is unhinging, I mean, like unleashing that kind of energy. And what you can do with it, of course, you know, you can get add a little bit of um, of the meth pills to it that the German army was taking um, as, as part of their rations. And you can go all the way to Stalin, you know, in one go um, before anything, before, before you get stopped at all. You know about the meth pills, right? Yeah. 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 Pervitin, um, Dyer's marzipan, uh, good stuff. It's, it's no longer. <laughs> But um, nevertheless, that doesn't really fully explain it. Like, what how, if if you give if you want to give a full account of the ideology and its context, this still this doesn't get the job. And it would go so much further to talk about the purpose for organizing, for agitation, for dehumanization, for um, untethering the actions of people from their sense of morality or by by flipping, like short-circuiting the polarity of that, which would be infinitely better than the liberal, the toothless liberal um, yakking of how it's, oh no, look at those people being evil and stupid and whatnot. I've heard about really enough of that, but um, it still doesn't really get to a critique of ideology. So how do we get there? Um, I think considering that it's I, for some reason, I managed to talk about this for 25 minutes. This was going to be my brief example, but hey. Um, so let me go and talk straight about Feuerbach and Christianity and skip the Hegel for now. Um, for now, just take my, my word for it that, he's uses, that he uses Hegel there, um, especially this figure of thought where Hegel says there is something that's, um, that's real, that's behind the appearances, um, that is true that we can get it. And there are some things that exist that are merely there, but they don't fulfill a criterion of reason. So we can dismiss that as false. Um, so just because something exists, exists doesn't mean we would want to afford it this, the same status of reality, of truth, of truthful existence. Uh, and the same you can do not just for institutions or, or things in the world, but also for ideas. So Feuerbach, like Hegel, is a trained is trained in Protestant theology, Calvinist specifically. Um, I think Feuerbach too was educated at Tübingen, and um, that's like one of the centers um, of, of Protestant theology. So a very systematic way of thinking about faith, God, um, and the universe and how the things in the universe work and are the deeds of God. Feuerbach sort of has um, lost his absolute faith, not least because in the aftermath of the French Revolution, the church, the clergy, the whole hierarchy was so involved in restoring the obviously tyrannical rule 
of monarchy and insisted in the Peace of Vienna, in the Treaties of Vienna, that the divine right of kings is re-established as something that is the basis for the state that cannot be questioned, and that church and state belong together, that they're linked, and that they need to serve each other. So Feuerbach doesn't think this is legitimate. He thinks this is untenable philosophically and theologically. It has it stands on no basis in the real world. It is a it does do you say sh chimera or chimera? I never know how to pronounce this word. It's like a mere appearance. It has no rational cause. This kind of the religious reasoning behind this restoration. At the same time, he's not ready to ditch Christianity, which he considers to be the one true religion. So how do you square them? In this book, the essence of Christianity, it's um, programmatic from the title that he is looking for that essence, the actual core, the subsistence of Christianity. What's the true thing about it? In what sense is the Christian belief system necessary and true? And he finds um, a limitless list of examples. Um, Ultimately, he says, what we attribute to God, um, God is absolute in his power and knowledge. God embodies virtue in the poor and pure form, or the cardinal virtues. God embodies love and wisdom and mercy and all those things. And that is the truth of Christianity, because these are, you can argue, the highest things um, that there are. But whose attributes are they really um, when it comes down to it? And when you take, you know, when you come out of Hegel's uh, philosophical corner, you realize that what Hegel argues is these are attributes of humanity. This is the human spirit at work. If fully understood, it is these things, all powerful. It encompasses everything, it makes everything into its material and creates it in the process. And it can change all those things, even if maybe just mentally. It is infinitely wise, forgiving, loving, and so forth, if properly understood. Reason has this ethical component. So what you have here, then, is an idealistic reflection of the true nature of humanity in the nature of God in the faith in the true Christian faith. So God is real in the, to the extent that the substance of God, the essence of Christianity, is the true nature displaced into the heaven of humanity. Some people read this and are offended because they read it as Feuerbach saying, oh, so God is just made up. People invented Christianity. That means you really... Um, you, you did, you're not doing justice to, to Hegel here. Nothing is ever made up. No way of thinking is ever just like on, on a whim. If you come to a true concept, it absolutely has to be that way and reflect something real in a way that makes sense. So no, um, it, to say that God and the Christian God, in particular the Christian faith, reflects something real, and that this real thing is the nature of humanity um, is not to say that humans arbitrarily invented it. It is to say that it's the necessary reflection of the real thing. Um, by contrast, and in the second book of this volume, uh, The Essence of Christianity, theology is a lie, true and true. It posits God as an illogical, cruel, arbitrary, um, hateful, almost demonic creature. It makes no sense. It does not conform to human ethics or logic. It does not con uh, conform to the natural world and the laws of nature. Um, so he goes through all the stuff in theology that he considers to be examples of how man, acting as interpreter of God's nature, um, damaged 
Christianity, distorted it and created something that allows us to say whenever a person starves to death or is denied opportunities or whatever, is not given food stamps, that's the Christian thing to do because it says by the um, sweat of thy brow that you eat your, your food and if you don't work, well, then, then you're not God's a, a problem. So Feuerbach, that's just a recent example, but Feuerbach says those kinds of things, wherever Christianity is used to justify cruelty, power, and so forth, that's where it's turning against its essence, it's turning against the essence of humanity. So there is a true faith and there is a false conscience. There's an ideology that is in Christian theology and there is a true faith that reflects something real in the world. Um, how do you then fix the world? Because clearly there's something wrong with the world. There's war, there's conflict, there's suffering. Um, how do you address that? Conflicts that humanity is facing is largely one of having missed the hint that we've been shown what humanity could be like if we recognize us as being truly capable of being godly, of being of acting and functioning in this way that we imagine only God can function, only God can function, then we would be fine. Like if we read the essence of Christianity, if we study Christianity and we, if we live accordingly, not because we have some kind of moral um, preceptor beating us, beating it into us, but because we realize this is truly who we are, then the world would be a better place. So it's an educational program to teach people about the possibility of not being racist, to teach people about the possibility of being truly charitable loving, merciful, and so forth, and all will be well. Um, this, of course, Marx criticizes in the thesis on Feuerbach as being entirely idealistic. It may be true, it may be not true, but it doesn't ask, A, what has led people to believe the wrong stuff all this time, and what is keeping them from acting in decidedly non-Christian um, I mean, I'm sorry, what is, what is incentivizing them uh, to act in decidedly non-Christian ways? What is keeping them from acting in Christian ways? Ultimately, um, Brecht, I think I quoted this before, when saying first comes the grub, then comes the morality, uh, summarize this kind of criticism. Why is humanity not godly? Not because we're not thinking in the right way, but rather because the circumstances um, suggests to us um, that we really can be and shouldn't be. So from that basis, Marx says, if you believe you have the thought system that reflects the true potential and nature of humans as good, and you want to bring that to humanity and educate them in that vein, you're really missing the point that if you have thought systems that are contradictory, and that don't make sense and that are inhumane, but usually they rest on something in society. Now, you might also say this is just accidental and doesn't reflect the real rational form of human existence. But warfare, um, need, unemployment, displacement, religious persecution, and so forth, nevertheless happen, and we exist in the world where they do happen, so people build their worldview in a way, first and foremost, that is based on making sense of the world that we have seen and experienced. And that as much as possible does two things, make sense of it so that it doesn't just appear like a completely chaotic business that makes us despair. And second, that gives us some kind of handle, some kind of agents, some kind of way to intervene in it and make it at least do something for us if not um, let us change it in ways that makes it more um, suit our, our purposes in the long term. So nothing is going to change about the way people believe unless the way people live changes first. 
And it is <clears throat> at best a process that is back and, back and forth between the mental development, between the way people think about the world, and between the actual situation. So if you fight at the thinking of a person, not as of one person, you know, that would be like, if you're saying evil and stupid or insane, as in the example I gave you, you're assuming moral, intellectual um, inadequacy. You're assuming that somebody is not ticking quite well, all the way to the point of um, actual mental incapacity. The point rather, if somebody believes something that is contradictory, especially if it's a worldview that is widely shared, like Christianity, like Islam, like racism, um, whatever else widely shared thought system you can come up with, and it doesn't make sense, you want to find out why it is necessary for people to believe in it in this particular shape. But you can't just yank one part out of it introduce something else instead of it. You cannot make the mega movement about 18th century French poetry or Rococo furniture or anything like that. Specific aims and goals you cannot replace. So why is that? How can you show that things in the world make this ideology necessary in this context? How is it, in other words, not just false consciousness, where we want to ask people to change their thinking, but how is it necessary false consciousness? The way that if we want to address why it's there, we want to be able to critique the world as it is and the things in the world so that we understand why people come up with these particular necessary delusions. So this would be a better way of looking at the long-term persistence of, say, identifying groups of Black people, especially men, especially like refugees introduced into a community from, like, from someplace else without much local, um, you know, acclimatization. Why it is that these groups are often denounced as less than human, predatory, um, carriers of disease and subversion. More broadly speaking, this too is something that is brought to bear against immigrants and outsiders, um, not just specific immigrants from specific places that came all of a sudden. So um, that limits the ability to say, well, maybe people were just overwhelmed with the, with the alienness, you know, the xenophobia, the hell there is. Um, that's not a thing. So what is there? wrong with the way of thinking about the in-group, the nation, the people, the biological makeup of um, a people, about culture, about identity. What is wrong with all those things that makes it possible to identify one group of people, any group of people, as the complete antithesis to them, that violates all that is good and holy, including actual literal kittens, you know, um, <laughs> internet AI-generated internet kittens in need of protection. Um, that is the question that you want to answer. Does that make sense on some level? Or if it doesn't, on what level doesn't it make sense? Like, do you, do you follow my argument why I think there is a need to actually if you want to critique the ideas, forget about, you know, you're not doing the job if you're saying, oh, this is so stupid, this is not true. Irrelevant, absolutely pointless. You want to be able to criticize the social reality that necessarily leads to the emergence of these and related ideas time and again. If you really think these ideas are in some way, not merely ideas, but are part of a broader pattern of threatening, menacing people, harming them, I don't know. Question. Can you expand on what you mean by social reality? Yes. I mean that what people see in the world. Um, in what context did I use that? Um, so if you're critiquing a bad idea, uh -huh. you need to critique the social reality that created that, that idea. That makes it plausible. I don't think that 
people still create ideas, but they create them in order to make sense of the things that they see and experience. So um, if you live in a world, broadly speaking, in which the likelihood that somebody with white skin lives in a place that is wealthy, clean, um, well run, and not driven by civil war and diseases is great. And the opposite is true, that if you encounter a person with less white skin, the likelihood that they're living in or hail from a place that is on average poorer, worse infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, is like antithetical to that. Um, that would be a material basis in the world and your experience of it to lead you to the conclusion that maybe poverty is a function of skin color and what and whiteness and it and um and wealth is a function likewise of a different skin color so you get so you give like material evidence it's not so it. much evidence but it's like something in the world that makes this idea plausible and i mean that idea you recognize as a salient one right mm -hmm. um like books have been written arguing that immigrants admitting immigrants to this country is going to make us into a third world country, for instance. That's like a widely held thing. So I thought I can't can remember her name. She was part of the original group of conservative activist students that included um oh great now I can't remember his name either at Dartmouth um in the 70s. The Nash de Souza and then her name I don't know she's like a fox host at this point. She wrote a book exactly on this on the subject. That is, many people read that argument, hear that, and think, yes, that makes perfect sense. Bring more immigrants here, and that will make us a third world country. And then you have the, um, the visuals that confirm that, you know, the picture of um, trash next to railway tracks under a highway overpass, in Chicago or Detroit or other places associated to, to, with immigrants or black people, contra, uh, juxtaposed with, you know, someplace clean and orderly and nice looking that we also associate with white people. Or the constant reminder that, you know, great things were created in the Middle Ages when people lived in homogenous Christian societies in, in Europe, Gothic cathedrals, and now all we get is like statues made out of old bicycles in, in the desert. Uh, so there's plenty of things that exist in the world um, what these ideologies can attach themselves to and that make them plausible, that almost call for them to explain them and justify. Because if it wasn't a natural thing that dark-skinned people live in poverty and white-skinned people in relative prosperity, then it might be looking like a scandal for that to be the case in the world. So you can either critique that as something that is not part of the natural environment and therefore you know, would not have subsistence as part of the real world because it isn't a rational way of, of things being, but it's something that would be scandalous because it's wrong and it shouldn't be that, which is troublesome because that might lead you to criticize imperialism, capitalism, those kinds of things. Um, it is not necessarily a conscious decision to say, well, I'd rather come up with an explanation that legitimizes and makes it appear natural, um, but it certainly suggests itself as an explanation. So, Therefore, um, again, because the, you know racism, racial ideology, and so forth, but to look at that as mental processes, as questions of character, of being ill-informed, um, of being a bad person, of wanting evil things, is so completely besides the point unless you actually want to look at the real disparity and look at their history and origin. It's also clear that imperialism does not exist because white people went out in order to create it because they hated black people. 
that is also crystal clear. Um, then reading up history is um, basically a, a flipped version of the story. Um, then there would be a lot of expense and time and, and resources spent on a on a in an act of spite, essentially. Does that example make sense for what I mean by like social reality that is reflected or possibly like refracted in a sick and twisted fashion in the ideology? Okay. So in the in the bigger picture, Marx in the end, who has no use for Christianity, calls it as you know the opiate for the people, um, the kind of thing that lets you um, forget about your troubles rather than address their causes. Um, but he also sees it as a necessary false uh, consciousness. It is a world that is not made, it is not organized in the in the right way that would allow people to be good, virtuous, you know. Yeah. There was uh, one like view I saw on that was of like Marx saying that like that like um, religion is like the opium of the masses. Some people kind of interpret that as like Marx saying that it's like a medicine for the masses because like, no. no, no, it is not. He is not saying it's opium for the masses in the sense that the priests are administering it in order to shut them down. Yeah. Um, decidedly not. Um, it is rather like people need that stuff in yeah. order to get through the day. And because they can't afford actual opium, that stuff is expensive. Mm -hmm. um, you know, out of China and all the process of ship, religion is a cheap alternative. And I think if you're if you're Catholic, no, wait a minute, no, 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 it's, they don't get that. But we we get to have the the actual bread and wine. Yeah. So you actually get like a decent meal if you go to communion, uh, or at least you get a bite of bread and some wine to go with it. Um, I don't know if they still do that, but definitely in the Protestant tradition, in the Calvinist tradition, you get a, a good bite out of the bread and a chug of wine. Not just opium. <laughs> yeah. So the question then is like, how how do you actually do that in a way that is conscientious? That it's not like, oh, you're just saying this because, or you're just making stuff up. You know, you actually want to make a compelling case why this specific way of thinking must follow from that specific way of being. Um, allowing, of course, for the observation that not everybody thinks that way, even though presumably they share the same social reality. So there is also something contingent in that, you know, in the ideology. Um, is that because they're more enlightened? You know, like I was saying, because Jason Stanley went to Yale uh, and he saw the, the light. Uh, is it because they're just better people? That is the unspoken assumption in every liberal condemnation of fascist ideas as evil and stupid. Of course, I don't share these rules. I'm a good person. Um, that also has very little to do with reality, of course. You've ever met a liberal? Um, I'm going to 